So IV Biology has added a new option this year. It's option F on microbiology. So I thought I'd say a little bit about um, how that's organized and what they expect of you. If you remember taxonomy of uh, living things, we have kingdoms, phylums, class order, family, genus, species. Seven different uh, levels of organization. Um, but really, there's another one, an eighth one, and it's uh, above kingdoms, super kingdoms, which they call domains. So imagine that all living things are first divided uh, into three domains and then divided into kingdoms. And those three domains are, you can see right in front of you, eubacteria, archaeobacteria, and eukaryotes. Now, uh, eukaryotes would be the kingdoms of animals, plants, protista, and um, fungi. And eubacteria and archaeobacteria would be what previously we knew as monera or bacteria. But actually there's two types of bacteria. There's eubacteria, which are true bacteria, what we typically think of as prokaryotes, uh, lack of organelles, uh, lack of nucleus, uh, 70S ribosomes and so forth, cell walls. But there's also archaeobacteria, which is a very small group of bacteria, but which has special implications. Now, you don't need to know, of course, the full scheme of things. Here we can see uh, how all the different kingdoms would uh, play out in a phylogeny tree. But what I do want you to know is some of the characteristics which distinguish between eubacteria and archaeobacteria. Now, eubacteria could do both respiration and photosynthesis for their types of metabolism. Uh, so for example, cyanobacteria, uh, blue-green, uh, would do photosynthesis. Why is that important? Well, if you remember Lynn Margolis' uh, theory, the endosymbiotic theory, she said that mitochondria originally arose from aerobic bacteria and that uh, chloroplasts originally arose from um, photosynthetic bacteria. So that's very important to know that bacteria can do both of those things. Now the new thing we haven't talked about is archaeobacteria. They're a very small group, uh, but the interesting thing about them is that they have similar transcription and translation processes to eukaryotes. So the idea is that they may have been the precursors actually to eukaryotes, that we may have actually evolved from this type of bacteria. How they exist today is really interesting. Most of the strains of archaeobacteria are resistant to extreme conditions. So, temperature and salt, for example. You could find archaeobacteria uh, growing in boiling sulfur hot springs. Uh, very, very unusual, and um, there's been great biological uh, uses for these types of bacteria. Now, eukaryotes would be everybody else. Animals, plants, fungi, and protista and we've discussed them uh, at great lengths throughout the year. Something I want you to know, by the way, before we move on. I talked just a moment ago about ribosomes and the endosymbiotic theory. Uh, prokaryotic cells have a type of ribosomal unit called 70S, very different from eukaryotic, which is 80S. So every cell in my animal body has 80S ribosomes, except, however, mitochondria they actually have 70S. Now, why would they have 70S? And the idea, according to Lynn Margolis in the embiotic symbiotic theory, is that mitochondria probably arose from bacteria in the same way that chloroplasts did, because they also have 70S units. Now, what we're going to do today, though, is we're going to go ahead and stain a slide using Gram stain, and we're going to look at the different types of bacteria. There's really three different types and they're characterized by their shape. The first one are rods and they look just like that, like little fingers really. So bacillus would be a great example of a rod bacteria. Then there's cocci. Those are really circles, so streptococcus for example. And then there's spirillum or what some people just call um, commas or spirals. And a good example of that would be vibrio. The other way you can really tell about bacteria is how they're organized. A lot of bacteria are just living by themselves. Some of them like to pair up, and we would call those diplobacteria. Some of them actually exist in clusters, just like grapes would. We call those staphylo, so for example, staphylococci. 
And then you got strepto, and we all know about streptococcus. Uh, those exist in long, long chains. So what you're going to do today is look at a bacterial slide and by the shape, try and narrow down what type of bacteria it might be. Another way we can look at bacteria is, are they aerobic or photosynthetic? We're not going to look at any photosynthetic today. But the thing we are going to look at today is a special stain called Gram stain. If they go ahead and stain blue to purple, we say they absorb the stain and they are Gram positive. If they don't, if they remain red, red will be the counter stain, then we'd say they're Gram negative. So when you go into the doctor, for example, and you're not feeling well, and the doctor takes a swab culture of your mouth or throat, what they're actually doing is probably doing a gram stain and then looking it under a microscope. And if it's gram positive or negative, the shape and the grouping would probably narrow it down for them what type of bacteria that would be. Now here's a gram stain. Gram stain is going to be a crystal violet. That's the major stain, but we're going to have a counter stain uh, which will be red, and that will be uh, safarin or saffron. This is a long procedure, and if you look at another video I have on the web here, uh, it'll explain to you how to go about and do this gram stain. Just let me show you a couple of quick examples here. This one here would be a gram positive stain uh, for rods, and uh, it's hard to tell because there's so many of them, but it looks like they might actually exist in chains. Here is one where we have a gram-positive cocci. You can see all the uh, circles. And I think that they're probably existing by themselves. There's just a lot of them, so they look clustered. And finally, here is a very comma spiral-looking shape uh, of spirillum, and those are gram-positive also. So, now that we have some idea, let's go ahead and do a stain.